Oh, amen. That's right. All things are possible. Only me. I have chosen tonight for a short text uh, or short reading, the Lord willing to give us the context of it, out of St. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. And then also I, I want to read from 36 to 40 just in a few moments. Now, uh, St. Matthew's, the uh, 13th chapter, and beginning with the 24th verse of the 13th chapter of St. Matthew. Listen close to the reading of the word. My words will fail, but his will not. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while he slept, his enemy came and sowed terriers among the wheat and went his way. But when the blades was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the terriers also. So the servant of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, Didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then has the terriers? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. And the servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go gather uh, them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the terriers, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will send forth the reapers. Gather ye together first the terriers, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat unto the garner. Did you notice? Gather the terriers first and bundle them. Now, uh, reading this, there was something strange come to me while I was setting up on top of the Catalina mountains the other night in prayer. And then I thought, where could I uh, gather a word that I could use for this that I wanted to speak on tonight? And I went down and found a word of discrepancy. So I got the dictionary and looked what the word discrepancy means, and it means uh, it's uh, sowing discord or, or being contrary. As Webster says, sowing a discord, something different, or being contrary to what's already been. So I thought the uh, text tonight, I call it the seed of discrepancy. And trust that the Lord will bless his word now as we approach it. And we also know he interpreted in verse 36 and, and to 43, uh, how that this seed matured. And while we're at it, let's just read that also. Verse 36 now, unto 43. And when Jesus had sent the multitude away, he went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the terriers of the field. And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man, and the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the terriers are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that soweth them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the terriers are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a fire, a furnace of fire, and there shall be weeping, and there be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who has an ear, let him hear. That's Jesus given the interpretation of the parable himself. Therefore, we know then what the interpretation means. And now, as we ap approach this, of uh, this sowing of the seed and, and the reaping, now, 
he interprets it, and then I believe that Jesus was speaking this parable in his day, but was meaning it to be at the end of the world or the end of the age, which is this day. And I believe this uh, little text tonight is a very ap appropriate for the hour that we're living in, because Jesus uh, uh, distinctly said here that the gathering would be at the end of this world, that that's when the end would be, the gathering of the wheat and also the gathering of the terriers and burning them and to take in the wheat into the kingdom. And I believe it was this way, and another scripture leads me to believe this way, I have written down here, is Matthew 24, 24. The word said that, talking about this, the, seat, the seat of discrepancy, Jesus said that the two would be so close together that it would deceive the very elected if it were possible. Almost exactly the same. Another place in the scripture where it's written that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. I remember my first experience of ever coming amongst the Pentecostal people. I was at Mishawaka, Indiana, and I was at a great convention, a hall about like this, where the North and the South had come together because of them days of the segregation they had to meet up there. They were two great orders of the Pentecostal brethren. I had never heard of them or met them before. The first time I ever heard speaking in tongues. And at the end of the row of the convention, me being a, not a member among them, I was just a young Baptist minister. I sat way back in the back. And I remember the first time I heard anyone speak in tongues, I didn't even know what what was all about. And then these two men mainly sat up in the front. One would speak in tongues and the other would interpret what the man said. Well, I just started studying my Bible as hard as I could there then and found out that that was scriptural. That's exactly what it, the scripture of the Holy Spirit would do. Well, about a day after that, that night my heart was so stirred, I slept in a cornfield. I didn't have enough money to get me a, a, a bed, so I just had enough money to get home on. And I got me some donuts, a couple of days old, or rolls it was, and for my breakfast, and I was welcome to eat with them, but I didn't have no money to put in. And them days, that was in the Depression, 1933, so it was, a, it was pretty hard going. And um, so uh, I thought, uh, well, I, I don't want to eat with them, but I want to know what they've got. They've got something, and I haven't. So that morning, I, they asked me, all ministers, to come to the platform and just identify yourself, who you are, where you're from. Well, I... I just said, William Branham, evangelist, Jeffersonville, sat down. Well, at that time, I was the youngest minister on the platform. And the next day, they called me to the platform to speak. And then after I spoke, uh, we had a great time. And then I began to meet different people, inviting me to their churches. Then after, the, after that, well, I thought if I could only get where these two main men was that spoke in tongues and interpreted it. That was burning me up in my heart. I wanted it so bad. Well, as I've told you at the beginning, a little gift that you pull over. You know, gifts and callings are without repentance. You have them all your life. See, you're born with them. If they're gifts of God. So, always, since a little bitty baby, it always happened to me. And people who knows me all my life know that's true. Well, if I thought, I didn't know what it was, then call it a vision. I just didn't know what it was. But I thought if I could ever talk to them. Well, and the spirit that was in the building felt like it's really the spirit of God. So I, I got to talk to one of them, and I asked him a few questions, and he was a real genuine Christian. There was no doubt about that. That man was a real believer. And the next man, when I talked to him, if I ever met a hypocrite, that was one of them. That man was actually, his wife was a blonde-headed woman, and he had children by two children by a black-headed woman. And... I thought, well, now what? Here it is. I'm, I'm all mixed up. I'm a fundamentalist. It must be the word or it, it isn't right. And here's that spirit. One rang out, according to all I know, genuine, and the other was no good at all, and the spirit falling on both of them. Now how can that be? I had me puzzled. Two years later, I've been praying in a cave where I'd go to pray. Got dusty in the cave, and one afternoon I walked out, laid my Bible on a log, and the wind blowed it open to... Hebrews, the sixth chapter, which said uh, that in the last days how it would be if we 
fell away from the truth and renewed ourselves again unto repentance. There was no more sacrifice for sin. And how the thorns and thistles, which is nigh unto rejection, whose end is to be burned. But the rain cometh upon the earth often to water it, to dress it. But the thorns and thistles would be rejected, but the wheat would be gathered. And I, I thought, well, it just the wind had to blow that open. Well, I just laid the Bible down again, and I thought, well, now, I'll just... Uh, and here come the wind and blow it open. That happened three times. And I thought, well, now, that's strange. And then I was raised up, and I thought, Lord, why would you open that Bible for me to read that? I, when I get down to that word, thorns and thistles, which is nine to rejection, whose end is to be burned. I thought, why would you open that to me there? And as looking out across... Now, these real visions come without pulling into any gear. That's this God, see, that... I looked and I seen an earth that was turning out in front of me. And I seen it was all disked up. There was a man dressed in white, went around sowing wheat. And after he went around the curvature of the earth, around come a man who looked horrible. He was dressed in black. And he was throwing uh, weed seeds all over it. They both come up together. And when they did, they both was thirsty because a rain was needed. And each one looked like was praying with his little head bent over, Lord, send the rain, send the rain. The great clouds come up, and the rain fell upon both of them. When it did, the little wheat jumped up and began to say, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! And the little wheat jumped up right at the same side and said, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! And then the vision was interpreted. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. The same Spirit can fall in a meeting and everybody rejoice in it. Hypocrites, Christians, and all together. Exactly right. But what is it? By their fruits they are known. See? Yes. That's the only way it can ever be known. Then you see that now a sense wild oats or wild wheat and grain sometimes impersonates a genuine domestic grain so close that it would deceive the very elected. I think we're living in a timely age when these things should be uh, uh, preached on and talked about. Notice in verse 41... The two also very close, so close in the last days till he didn't do. He could not dis, depend on some certain church to separate him. Say the Methodists or the Baptists or the Pentecostals to separate him. He said he sends his angels to separate him. An angel is coming to bring the separation, the segregation between the right and the wrong. And no one can do that but the angel of the Lord. He's the one that's going to tell which is right and which is wrong. God said He will send His angels at the last times. Not angels down through here, but angels at the last time, and would gather together. We know that this is the coming harvest time now. Now, an angel is actually interpreted a messenger. And we see that there are seven angels of the seven churches. And now, no, through the church ages, notice who he said that the sores were and also what the seed was. One, the sower was he, the Son of God, who went forth sowing seed. And an enemy came behind him, which was the devil, and sowed the seed of discrepancy behind the sowing of the right seed. Now, friends, that has happened through every age since we've had a world. Exactly. All the way from the beginning, it started the very same thing. Now, he said, the seed of God, the Word of God, Jesus said in a certain place, that the Word is a seed, and every seed will bring forth of its kind. And now, if the Christian, the children of God, the children of the kingdom has become the seed of God, then they must be the Word of God. The Word of God manifested in the age that they're living in, or the promised seed of that age. God gave His Word at the beginning, and each age has had its seed, its time, its promises. Now, when Noah came on the scene, and he was the seed of God, the Word of God for that age, when Moses came, he could not come with Noah's message. It wouldn't work. Because he was a seed of God at that time. Then when Christ come, he could not come with Noah or Moses' age. It was his time for a virgin to conceive and to bring forth a son. And he would be the Messiah. Now, we've lived through Luther's age, Wesley's age, Methodist age, all down through the ages in the Pentecostal age. And each age has given a promise of the Word. 
And the people of that age that manifest that promise word is the seed of that age, according to what Jesus said right here. They are the children of the kingdom. That's right. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit operating through his children is those seed of the kingdom at that age. Notice the terriers was the one, the enemy, Satan, who sowed discord or the, uh, the seed of discrepancy. He was the one guilty of doing this horrible thing. Satan sowed his seed from the beginning when God placed his first harvest of human beings upon the earth. Adam, of course, as yet knew that there was a, a knowledge of truth and of right and wrong, and he had never come to that as yet. But we find out God gave his children his word for their defense. There, we have no other defense than the word of God. That is our defense. There's no uh, bombs, no shelters, no hiding places, no Arizonas or Californias or wherever it is. There's only one defense we have, and that is the Word. And the Word was made flesh and dwell among us, which is Christ Jesus. He is our only defense. Being in Him, we are safe. Not even sin is imputed to a genuine believer. Did you know that? He that's born of God does not commit sin. He cannot sin. See? It's not even imputed. Why, well, David said, Blessed is the man who God will not impute sin. When you're in Christ, you have no desire to sin. The worshiper once purged has no more conscience of sin. You don't desire it. Now, to the world, you might be a sinner, but to God, you're not because you're in Christ. How can you be in a sinner when you're in the sinless one? And God only sees him who you are in. Now, this harvest time, at the beginning, when God sowed his seed upon the earth and gave it in the hearts of his children, his family. To keep that word, that was their only defense. Keep that word. Here come the enemy in and broke that barrier by sowing the seed of discrepancy, contrary to the word of God. If that was discrepancy in the beginning, it's still anything that will add anything to the word of God is still the seed of discrepancy. I don't care where it comes from. If it's from organization, if it's from... Uh, military sources, if it's from political powers, anything that's contrary to the Word of God is the seed of discrepancy. When a man stands and says he's a gospel preacher and says that the days of miracles is past, that's the seed of discrepancy. When a man stands and says that he's a minister, a pastor of a church of somewhere, and he does not believe that Jesus Christ is the same in every detail except the physical body, same yesterday, today, and forever, that's a seed of discrepancy. When he says that miracles and apostolic age passed, that's seed of discrepancy. When they say there's no such a thing as divine healing, that's seed of discrepancy. And the world is full of it. It crowds out and chokes out the wheat. We notice that the first sore of the seed of discrepancy was branded the devil. And we know it was in Genesis 1. Now we find out uh, over here in, in the book of Matthew, the 13th chapter, Jesus still brands any discrepancy to his word as being the devil. And this 1956, anything that sows discrepancy contrary to the written word of God or puts any private interpretation to it is a seed of discrepancy. God will not honor it. He can't. It won't mix. It certainly will not. It's like mustard seed. It won't mix with anything else. You can't hybrid it. It's got to be the genuine thing. Seed of discrepancy. Now we find, when God sowed his seed in the Garden of Eden, we find out that it brought forth an evil. But when Satan sowed his seed of discrepancy, it brought forth a cane. One brought forth a righteous one. One brought forth an unrighteous one. Because that Eve listened to the word of discrepancy contrary to the word of God and it started the ball of sin rolling right there and it's rolled ever since. And we'll never get it all out until the angels comes and segregates the thing and God takes his children to the kingdom and the terriers will be burned. Notice those two vines. If we just had more time on this subject but just to hit the high spots, so we can go right into praying for the sick in the next few minutes. 
Notice, their seeds grew together just exactly like God said over here also in the 13th chapter of our text tonight of Matthew. Let them grow together. Now Cain went to the land of Nod, found himself a wife and married, and Abel was slewing, and God raised up Seth to take his place, and the generation started moving on between right and wrong. Now, we notice they gathered each one of them time after time, and God had to, it got so wicked that God had to destroy. But they finally came forth unto both of those seeds, the seed of discrepancy and the seed of God, put forth their genuine heads. And that wound up in Judas is a carrot and in Jesus Christ. For he was the seed of God. He was the beginning of the creation of God. He was nothing less than God. And Judas Iscariot was born the son of perdition, come from hell, returned to hell. Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the Word of God, made manifest. Judas Iscariot, in his discrepancy, was the seed of the devil come to the world and for deceit, just like he was at the beginning, Cain, his former father. Judas only played church. He wasn't really sincere. He didn't actually have faith. He had never betrayed Jesus. But you see, he sowed that seed of discrepancy. He thought that he could make friends with the world, mammon, and also have friendship with Jesus. But it was too late for him to do anything about it. When the dead hour came, when he did this evil thing, he crossed the separating line between going forward and returning back. He had to go on in the way that he went as a deceiver. He sowed the seed of discrepancy. He tried to find favor with those great organizations of that day, with the Pharisees and Sadducees, and thought he'd make himself a piece of money and would be popular among the people. If that doesn't cause so many people to get in that discrepancy, uh, trying to find favor with man, let's find favor with God, not with man. But that's what Judas done when this discrepancy headed up in him. And we know that Jesus was the Word. St. John 1 said, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt here among us. Then the Word is the seed, then the seed become flesh and dwelt among us. If Judas was the seed of the enemy and the discrepancy, it also become flesh and dwelt among us. In the person of Judas is a carrot. He never had no real, real faith. He had a, a what he thought was a faith. There's such a thing as having faith and a make-believe faith. And a genuine faith of God will believe in God, and God is the Word. It'll never add nothing to it. The Bible tells us if we add one word or take one word away, our part will be taken from the book of life. Revelation 22, 18, the last closing chapter. In the first beginning, the first book of the Bible, God told them not to break one word of that. Every word must be kept. They must live by that word. Jesus, in the middle of the book, come along and said that in his age, and said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that it, it comes out of the mouth of God. And in the closing age of revelations foretold to us that whosoever shall take one word out of the book or add one word to it, his part will be taken from the book of life. Therefore, there can be nothing shadowy, just a genuine, unadulterated Word of God. That's sons of God, daughters of God, who's not born by the will of man or by shaking a hand of some form of baptism, but born in the Spirit of God by the Holy Ghost and the Word manifesting itself through them. That's genuine seed of God. The enemy joins church and becomes very orthodox in a creed or something. But that's not the, that's discrepancy. Anything that interferes with that uh, string of genuine truth of God's Word. And how do we know? We say, well, the, uh, have you got a right to interpret it? No, sir. No man has a right to interpret God's Word. He's his own interpreter. He promises it, then he does it. That's the interpretation thereof. When he promises it, then he fulfills it. That's the interpretation of it. Anything contrary to God's Word is the uh, discrepancy. Absolutely. Now, as I said, Judas has no real faith. He had a make-believe faith. He had a, a faith 
that he thought that that was the Son of God, but he didn't know that was the Son of God. He wouldn't have done it. And a man who will compromise on this Word of God being the truth, he's got a make-believe faith. Shania Wine, servant of God, will hang on that Word. A few nights ago, a certain minister of, of Arizona, of a great famous school here in this city, came to me and said, I, I want to straighten you out on something. I said, when you get a chance, I said, this is the best chance I know of. Come on over. And so he came over. He said, Mr. Branham, you're trying to, I believe you're sincere and you're honest, but you're trying to introduce to the, a world of apostolic doctrine. And said, the apostolic age ceased with the apostles. I said, the first thing I'd like to ask you, my brother, <clears throat> do you believe that every word of God is inspired? He said, yes, sir, I certainly do. I said, then... Would you show me in the word where the apostolic age ceased? Now, you show me where it is, I'll believe with you. Now, I said, the writer of the apostolic, the one that had the keys to the kingdom, on the day of Pentecost, when the apostolic age wasn't introduced, they said, man and brethren, what can we do to be saved? He said, repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, how can the word contradict itself? A man said, I have an awful cold tonight. I said, I think so too. See? Now, you tell me, is God still calling? If God's still calling, then the apostolic age is still in existence? Certainly. As many as the Lord our God shall call, ever call, ever will call, as many as he shall call, it will still be the apostolic age. For Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Now, we find today that this discrepancy has been sowed through every age. If it was possible to get it in the next 10 or 15 minutes, I would do it, but you can't. Down through the ages, we are all, most all of us read the Bible. And now, like when Jesus came and he found that discrepancy contrary, he was the Word made manifest. He was God's interpretation of the Word. Because he said, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. Amen. There you are. He, the, he was the interpretation of the Word. And every born again Son and daughter of God of this age is the interpretation of the Word. You are written epistles, read of all men. Yes. Notice, he said, In vain they do worship me, teaching discrepancy for doctrine. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the discrepancy. Doctrine of man, creeds of man. Teaching that to be... Uh, the Word of God, when it has nothing to do with the Word of God. Look, each age produced such a crop. Every age has did it. And ours is no excuse. We have the same thing and a greater age of it than all the other ages put together. For this is the ending of world's history. This is the great discrepancy that's ever been up on the earth is on the face of the earth today. Discrepancy in other ages pulled them away from the true and living God to idols. Today, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, that it would be so close it would deceive the very elected if it was possible. Talk about discrepancy. Oh, it is so cunning. Satan is among the people and just such a theologian, such a doctor of divinity, can teach that word almost perfectly. Jesus said so. But just watch him. There'll be somewhere he said, well, now that wasn't for this. Oh, yes, it is too. Because God said it was. Look what it did. That same discrepancy brought the, God's wrath upon the days of Noah. When God sent his prophet out and preached as a flaming fire, called repentance to the people, and the discrepancy drowned it out. Then what did Satan do? Come right behind in Ham and started sowing it again. That's exactly right. Along come Moses, the great prophet, to bring the children of Israel up out of the wilderness. What happened? Moses, the great prophet of God. Bringing them the absolutely truth, vindicated truth. He had met God. God proved that he had met him. How those people back there, those priests, and they had the religion, the rituals, and the rites, and everything. But Moses stood as a vindication of the interpretation of the word. Don't forget that. 
Moses was God's interpretation of his promise. He said he'd do it. He was God's interpretation. What happened? The church just got started out of Egypt on its feet a few days. And what happened? Satan come along with his discrepancy in the person, the second Cain, which was Balaam. And he sowed discrepancy amongst them. We know that's right. That Balaam, the teaching of Balaam, that we were all the same. We serve the same God you do. Fundamentally, he was right. Because he offered a sacrifice that God offered, seven rams, seven bullocks on seven altars, and prayed to the same God, just as perfect as Moses did down in the wilderness. Just exactly the same. But they were not the same. Before shouting to us what would come to pass, there was again Cain manifested in the the person of Balaam. And there was God manifested in the person of Moses, interpreting his words to a human being, making himself known, his promise to a human being. And the discrepancy raised up. So did he do it in the time of Judas. There he come with his discrepancy. And remember, this sin that those people believe that we're all the same. We worship the same God. We should all belong to the same church. We should be the same people. That sin was never forgiven Israel. Jesus said himself, they all are dead. They perish, all but three of them. That was the ones who held on and believed the promise. When the weakling said, we cannot take the land, it's too much for us, and so forth. Caleb and Joshua, still the people said, we're more than able to take it. Because God promised it to us, I don't care what the opposition is. And we still can preach the divine healing, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and still have the power of God to separate us from the things of the world. God said so. The apostolic age has never ceased, and it will not cease. It goes on. So we find the same old sore of discrepancy. And remember, that sin was never forgiven. Now, brother, if it was never forgiven then, what about now? When the the real seed of all the ages is coming together. Notice this great thing that Balaam did. It went on and on and finally ended in the coming of... uh, of Judas is a carrot, and Jesus. What was it? Judas and Jesus was just exactly a figure of Cain and Abel. For as Judas was religious, so was Cain religious. Cain built an altar. He made a sacrifice. He worshipped God. He was just as sincere in it as the other one was. But you see, he didn't have the revelation of what the word was. He thought it was Adam and Eve that eat some apples or some fruit. And can't Abel, by revelation, know that it was wrong. It was the blood that brought him out and he offered a lamb and God testified his offering was right. Then he got jealous and tried to kill his brother. And as he killed his brother upon the same altar that his sacrifice died on, the lamb died upon the altar. So did Judas Issacharit portray Jesus Christ upon the altar of God and kill him just as Cain killed Abel because Cain was the seed of discrepancy. And so was Balaam, the hireling prophet, a man who ought to know better. And God warned him through signs and wonders and even a mule speaking in unknown tongues. And still he went right on just the same he was born to be a, a sower of the discrepancy. And if Jesus predicted this age to end up in the greatest discrepancy that ever was, the lady of seeing church age, lukewarm, that put him out of the church. How could it be anything else but that? Discrepancy. Certainly it is. It ends in that age. And it was Cain and Abel again on Calvary. Now I notice, as ever, as soon as Jesus went away, went into heaven... The Holy Spirit was sent back. That was the seed, the life giver unto the Word, as we spoke last night. It's the one that quickens the Word. Quicken means brings to life. The genuine Holy Spirit only brings to life 
the Word that it is. It won't bring your creed to life. It can't because it's nothing of the creed. It is the life of the Word of God, for it is God. And it quickens that body. Now, notice, as they did, then the Bible said, and John spoke to his children and said, Little children, you have heard of the Antichrist, which was to come into the world, said, which already is in the world, and it working in the children of disobedience. Now, that was long about... 30 years after the coming of the Holy Ghost. We find when the Holy Ghost comes, the real seed, the real life giver to the seed, then here comes that discrepancy in again. And notice, on it went. It had, the real word had been vindicated. The prophets of old had vindicated the word of God to be the truth as they went down. If anybody ever read the Nicaea Council or the pre-Nicaea Council, then 15 days of bloody politics, well then bunch of Romans down there wanted to bring in and make a denomination out of that church. Prophets came in, wrapped in sheepskin, eating herbs, and stood for that word. But what did it do? It had to be like Cain. It had to be like Abel. One had to die. Certainly it did. And the word lost its influence amongst the people, and they all voted out the true word and took in dogmas of discrepancy of the early Catholic church. They added a pope, they added a bishop, they added this, that, the other. They've taken away the real true meaning of Peter and of, of, of Mary and, and all the rest of it, and made idols and made nothing but just a pagan ceremony out of so-called Christian religion. What was it? Seed of discrepancy and organized. Organized for the first time on earth, a church. What was it? That seed of discrepancy. We started sowing. Something adding to, taking away. Whoever heard in the Bible not eat meat on Friday? Whoever heard in the Bible of anything of sprinkling instead of baptizing in mercy? Whoever heard of those things, a Hail Mary or something? Whoever heard of some of this rotten Tommy Rot of these Protestants too? Pot can't call kittle greasy. Right! Just guilty of the least is guilty of the whole. Whoever heard of God ever dealing in an organization? Show me one time that one ever organized and ever stayed alive. They died immediately and never did rise again. It's time that something takes place. It's time for God to move. To kill the influence amongst the people. Same thing's been done today. They kill the influence. They all oh, that bunch of holy rollers. There's nothing to them. That... Watch discrepancy. Meet the word face to face and see what it is. See if God interprets his own word. God's able these stones to rise, children of Abraham. The word had been thoroughly vindicated by them early Christians, how God d delivered them from everything and diseases, and they had prophets, and they spoke in tongues, interpreted and gave messages that proved to be exactly the truth every time. But in the face of all that vindicated word, the people voted it out and voted a denomination. That's the mother of all organizations. Both are fully matured now. They started seeding again. It died out, but it bloomed again in the days of Luther. As we know from the former message on the morning of the breakfast. It bloomed out in the day of Luther. Now what did they do? Immediately after that great man died, they made an organization. It bloomed out. And again, in the days of John Wesley, when them Anglins with all their eternal securities and everything had bounded up into a place to what... Almost universalism. And what happened? God raised up a man named John Wesley and slayed the whole thing. And as soon as he died, him and Asbury and them, what happened? They organized it. Now they got all kinds of Methodists. Uh, then along come one or the other. Alexander Campbell, John Smith, and what more. Finally, all broke the Pentecost, coming out of all of it. What happened then? They did run well. What did hinder you? You went right back in the same mud you come out of. Right back in the same slop. Went back to discrepancy and to make organizations. You had to compromise on the Word. And every time God had sent something new, you couldn't receive it. That's right. Discrepancy again. And notice, as I said the other day, that first little husk had come forth from the root, comes up into the leaves and up into the tassel, then back into the stalk again. It comes out. That little husk of wheat almost looks like the grain itself. And we thought it was, but when you open it up, there's no grain there at all. It's only a supporter for the grain to grow by. And it dies also, and the life goes right out of it and goes into the grain. Notice.
So they call the churches that sold. We find out today that our so-called churches, even our Pentecostals, we went out. We couldn't be satisfied. We had to make groups of our own. Everything come up. We had to have this. We had to have this. We had to have another group. And this fellow raised up and said, he's coming in a white cloud. He says, ah, he's coming on a white horse. All right, we'll make two groups. See? What is it? Sowing up discrepancy. When he comes, whatever it is, he'll interpret his own word when he comes. Let's wait till that time. Catch the talking about that. You don't even get the message of the day. Always pointing to what God's going to do or what he has done and ignoring what he's doing. That's the way we get discrepancies in it. Now we notice that today our churches, our, all of our churches, has sold to the winds and are reaping the whirlwind. We don't have the prayer meetings. We don't have the services we used to have. What's the matter? We've let down the bars on everything. Look, even our Pentecostal churches, sitting full of bobbed-haired women. That used to not be permitted. Painted faces, wearing fingernail polishes, all kind of stuff. Getting up. Man, out here with like Rickies and so forth. Married three or four times and deacons. Oh, what a discrepancy. It's filth. How do they do it? God wouldn't have it in His church. They have to go to an organization to get into it. Somebody afraid to say something about it because he'd be kicked out of the organization. God give us man who's not connected with nothing but God and His Word that'll tell the truth about it. Exactly what we need. What have we done? Sowed discrepancy. We've sowed to the winds and now we're reaping the whirlwind. Notice that they're now being gathered together for the burning. Did you notice Jesus said first, gather them together. Bundle them. And then put all the bundles in one pile, and I'll burn them. There's a little bundle called Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran. They're all gathered together in the World Council of Churches. What is it? Gather them first. Hallelujah. Did you notice? He gathers the carriers first. Gets them away from the wheat. Separates them. Gather them together and burn them. They're all to be burned. With the judgments of God for sowing discrepancy among the people. Things that say, having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. Denying the word just to hold up some religious rites or some dogma that somebody's injected in trying to put in the word of God. It won't work. It's a discrepancy. I screamed today as it was uh, the great prophet of long ago, Amos, when he comes down in that city, he said, I'm not a prophet nor a son of a prophet. But if the lion roars, who can but fear? He said, when God speaks, who can but prophesy? He predicted judgment upon that generation and said, the very God that you claim to serve will destroy you. You put this its own tape. You remember, the very God that these people now that's gathering all this great big harvest of, of World Council of Churches. And you're going to have to go into it. You can't stay out of it. You're either going to be inefficient, get out of it, or you're going into it. There ain't going to be no middle ground. It'll be the mark of the beast. No man can buy or sell except he that has the mark or has got the discrepancy. Now, stay out of it. Get out of it. Flee it. Stay away from it. The God that they claim they're serving will destroy him. The great God of love who wants, said, well, Jesus prayed that we should all be one. Then he also said, how can you walk together, two walk together, to be agreed? He said, one like he and the Father are one. And the Father was the Word, and he was the Word made manifest. He was one with the Father. Because he was the manifestation of God's promised Word. And so is it today or any other day. Amen. Yes, sir, that God is one. He wants us to be one. How can this be one, this and denying the virgin birth, and this don't deny divine healing, and this, that, all of them in a mess like that. Some of them even don't even believe in God. Believe he was the Son of God. Believe he was the Son of Joseph called the Son of God. Certainly, the twin brother to the Lutheran, Swingleys, believed that. That he was absolutely just a good man. The Christian science said he was a prophet, just an ordinary man. He wasn't divine. Well, if he wasn't divine, he's the greatest deceiver the world ever had. He was God or he was nothing. He was divine. He was deity himself made flesh among us in the person of the Son of God. Certainly, that's what he was. Now, we see the discrepancy has come in. We know that it's here. Nobody can deny it. Oh, my. Just notice, he will destroy that group that claim they're serving God. You watch it. God planted his seed. I'm closing because it's time to start the prayer line. God planted his seed, and his seed is Christ. 
I'm going to preach on that in a few nights where God decided to put his name. Lord willing, maybe at one of the breakfasts when I have a little more time. Look, he is the only way of escape. He is the only true potentate. He's the only true God. None other besides him. I am God and God alone, he said. Jesus said, this is the commandment. Hear you, O Israel, I'm the Lord your God, just one God. I am he. Why do you look for another? Another will come. I come in my Father's name and you receive me not. But another will come in his own name and him you will receive. And they did it at Nicaea. Are you a Christian? I'm Baptist. Are you a Christian? I'm Pentecost. Are you a Christian? I'm Methodist. Another name. But when it comes to that name of Jesus Christ, they walk as far from it as they can. They don't want nothing to do with it. For he is the word. And the word declares itself. Notice, the only way of escape, he is the rose of Sharon. The Bible said he was. Every title in the Bible of God belongs to Jesus Christ. He was Alpha Omega, the beginning and the end. He that was, which is, and shall come. The root and offspring of David. Both root and offspring of David. The morning star. The rose of Sharon. The lily of the valley. The Alpha Omega. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. All in Jesus Christ. He was the full manifestation of Jehovah God made flesh to dwell among us. Exactly what he was. He was the rose of Sharon. What did they do with the rose of Sharon? They squeezed it out, mashed it out to get the perfume out of it. A beautiful rose has to be squeezed down to get the perfume from the rose. And that was a beautiful life. And there was a life lived like it, but it had to be squeezed out on Calvary. See, they took the anointing of the rose of Sharon and put it up on Aaron. He had to be anointed with that for to go in before the Lord in the holy place. And the holy uh, veil, he had to be anointed with the rose of Sharon to go in to sprinkle the mercy seat. Each year, and that anointing must be up on him, a sweet-smelling Savior unto the Lord. Packing the blood of the Lamb before him, after it had also been sprinkled by the Lamb. Pomegranates and bells around his garments, he had to walk a certain step, playing holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Notice, he is that rose of Sharon, that sweet-smelling Savior. The anointing upon his people. You cannot come before him with any creed, any other thing, but anointed with that rose of Sharon. The Word. He also is the lily of the valley. Now, how do you get opium? You get opium when you take a lily and squeeze it out. You get the opium. Doctors use it in their laboratories. Take a man that's nervous and frustrated, or a woman, and she feels like she's going to go crazy. She's walking the floor and screaming. She's in hysterics. A doctor will take a little of his lily opium and push it into her arm or vein somewhere or his, and they quieten down. It's all over for a while. But just as soon as that opium dies out, here they come again worse than they ever was. But I'll tell you, friends, that's only a type of the genuine opium from the lily of the valley that I know. He is the lily of the valley. He was squeezed out on Calvary. He was wounded for our transgression. With his stripes, we were healed. In that, that squeezing out of the flowers, he was a flower. He's the greatest flower that ever grew was this lily of the valley and this uh, great rose of Sharon. Now, he hangs tonight, spanned between heavens and earth. I believe he was that time, rather, to, to take away the sin of the world and to bring healing back to the world. And the Bible said that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Friend, when God told Moses in the wilderness, which was a, a type of him, to lift up a brass serpent, and brass represents sin, judged. The serpent represents, the brass serpent represents sin already judged, as brass is divine judgment like the brazing altar where the sacrifices is laid. And also, Elijah looked up and he said, the skies is like brass, divine judgment up on an unbelieving nation. And it backslid from God. Brass represents judgment, divine judgment. And the serpent represented sin already judged. And Jesus was that serpent, made sin for us and took the judgments of God upon him. He was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Oh, God's got his cabinet full of opium tonight for you. Christian friend, you are sick and suffering. Oh, you're weary. It's just too hard for you. You can't stand it much longer. You're, you'll go wild in this modern day that we're living. Did you just hear Lifeline tonight? Not what they said at, at Russia says in 55 that they'll absolutely take full control of the whole world. Before that can happen, the rapture has to come. So how close is it, friend? It's right here, close now at hand. Won't you seek him tonight with all your heart? He is the lily of the valley. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's here tonight.
to lift himself up among his people, just like Moses lifted up the, the sin sign, judge, and not only sin, but sickness. Remember, Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the brass serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What did Moses lift it up for? For sin, unbelief, and for sickness. Jesus was lifted up also for sin, sickness, and unbelief. He was the same thing. Now tonight, in the days when we got this great discrepancy, Jesus Christ promised in Luke that in the days of the, before the coming of the Lord would be like it was in the days of Sodom. And when the Son of Man would reveal himself, like the Son of Man revealed himself to Abraham down there, Elohim, God made flesh among people and dwelt there with Abraham and showed him, told him what Sarah was thinking of, sitting behind him in the tent that he had never seen, told her what she, and called her name Sarah. Abraham, not his, not his name Abram, he started out with, but Abraham. Not Sarah, S-A-R-A, but S-A-R-A-H. Where is thy wife, Sarah? Said she's in the tent behind you. Said, I'm going to visit you according to the time of life. And she laughed. He said, why did she laugh? Now, Jesus said just before this great discrepancy is gathered and burned, that the Son of Man will reveal himself in the same manner as he did then. And that's what is it? It's a lifting up of fresh before you. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe it? Hey. Let us bow our heads then for prayer. Dear God, we love you. Your word is so, so foodful with us, Lord. We just love it. We live by it, Lord. It seems that our capacity is never sufficient. We just love to sit at your table around your word and enjoy the blessings, Lord, when we come together like us, brothers and sisters, who's been blood-bought by the Son of God. Who is the purchase of your blood? And we come here tonight, Lord, we've dedicated these nights for praying for the sick. And according to the scriptures, you said that by the stripes we were healed. It isn't necessary to pray then, only confess our sins. For by your stripes we were, past tense, healed. Oh, what a day of salvation. What a, what a promise by Emmanuel. That is certainly truth. You said a little while and the world won't see me no more. Yet you'll see me. For I, the personal pronoun of I, I will be with you even in you to the end of the world. And at the end of the time, this great consummation, you said just before it happens, will be just like before the fire fell in Sodom. And burn up the Gentile world. That there would come a revelation again of the Son of Man, just like it was at Sodom. Father, may the people not miss it. Now I pray, God. It's a crude little thing. If I said wrong, forgive me. Pull it into a gear. I love them, Lord. I, I pray that they won't miss it. Let this be one of the great nights, Lord. May every sick, afflicted, blind, whatever it is in here, Lord, be healed tonight. May every sinner be saved right in their hearts now. If they are an unbeliever, may they accept Christ at this moment. Granted, Father, it's all in your hands. We commit ourselves to you to see you come among us. And you said in St. John 14, 12, He that believeth in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. How we know that you made yourself known to the people. For you was that prophet that Moses said that would raise up. They hadn't had prophets for hundreds of years Discrepancy was on every hand, but yet the word of God had to be fulfilled. So the word become flesh, and so did the discrepancy. And Father, we see it again today. The discrepancy becoming one great big bundle, and we see the word coming the same way. Bless us tonight, Father. We commit ourselves to you with your word. Whatever you have need for us to do, do with us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. What he said. He may be wanting to tell us something, so just be real reverend. Behold, the hand of the Lord is here to save thee. Behold, the hand of the Lord is here to redeem thee. And to write thy name upon the Lamb's book of life. Believe ye the word of God, and obey it, and thou shalt have the peace of God upon thy soul, saith the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Did you ever read scripture? Or the enemy was coming and they were 
all gathered together, and the, the enemy was such a great force. And the Spirit of God fell upon a man and told him, and he prophesied and said, We're to go and lay in wait, and they destroy their enemy. There it comes again. There's the place to destroy your enemy. See, take the hand of God. The hand of God is Christ, of course, the Word. So take that in your hearts tonight. While we call the prayer line, I believe if Billy give out prayer cards again. They be, bees. Let's take B eighty five. Let's. We had fifteen last night. We usually try to get about fifteen a, a night. And then hold your cards. We'll get them out. Let's try about fifteen. Eighty five. B like Branham. You know, B eighty five to hundred. And we. Let's see who has B eighty five. Raise up your hand. You're sure? Oh, in the back. All right, 85, come up. Now, my son, so that there might be strangers here, wouldn't know how this was done. My son comes down here, or someone, if he isn't able to come, Brother Border, somebody else, some man, will come down and take these cards, a hundred of them, and send them before the people and mix them up together. So, therefore, he gives you a card. He can't tell you you're going to be up here on a platform. He don't know that. And neither do I know. I come at night, just pull out about 10 or 15 somewhere along in the cards. That doesn't have one thing to do with your healing. You can sit right there. Look last night. How many were here last night? Let's see your hand. How the people was just healed all out through the meeting. Now, that was 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90. Let's have them come right now. B, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90. There have been one... Uh, Surely, we need uh, uh, somebody's... Uh, here's another one. Yes, that'd make it. 90, 90 to 100 now. 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 99. If you can't move, if you're... Uh, I see we got a couple of three wheelchairs here now. Four of them, I believe I can see. If you got a prayer card, it's, it's your number's called. You can't move. Just raise your hand. We'll wheel it up here. And if you haven't got no prayer card, just sit there and pray and say, Lord Jesus... Let, let, let it be me tonight. How many here doesn't have a prayer card? Raise up your hand. Oh, my. All right. Now, let's just say this. I hope it don't sound sacrilegious. But there's a little woman one time that didn't have a prayer card, we'd say. She went pressing through the crowd. She said, now, listen close. If I can touch that man's garments, I'll be made well. How many knows the story? All right. And what did she do? She touched him and went over and sat down. And Jesus turned around. He knew where she was at. Is that right? He knew what her trouble was. Is that right? He knew what her trouble was. So he told her what her trouble was. And she felt in her body that the blood issue had stopped. Is that right? Because why? She had touched him. Now, how many Christians here tonight that know, according to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, that Jesus right now is a high priest. The high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. Is he? All right, if he is the same high priest, the same office, high priest, how would he act then? He would act just the same as he did then. Do you believe that? He would act just the same as he did then. If you can believe that. All right. How many believe that? Raise up your hands. I actually believe it. All right. Before they form the prayer line, let's have a prayer line out there. I know he's here. I, I, I feel his presence Amen. and I, I know that he's here. I was going to call out there. You just, just pray. Just look this way and pray. Just believe. A little lady sitting here looking right at me. Sitting next to a lady that's got glasses on. Can't you see that hanging over that woman? Look here. See? She's suffering with heart trouble. You believe that God will heal you? If you do, raise up your hand. That's what your trouble was. That's right. Now, if that was your trouble, raise up your hand so the people can see. Raise up your hand like that. Now, you don't have it no more now. Your faith made you well. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, there is a discrepancy. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I just keep praying. See, you don't have to be up here that you might know. Now, this is a lady... As far as I know, I've never seen her in my life. She's just a woman standing here and uh, got a prayer card. And didn't know whether he's going to be called or not. Somebody just give you a prayer card and 
you, your number's called, so you just come up here. Is that right? And I have no way of knowing what you are, who you are, where you come from, what you want, nothing about it. I'm just a man. You're the woman. That's right. This same picture come one time in the Bible, St. John, the fourth chapter. I said, what'd you do, Brother Bram? Just saying, a while ago, just pulled over in that little gear, see? I don't know, see? He has to do it. I don't know. How did that woman out there, i never seen that woman in my life. She's a total stranger to me. I believe it was a woman. Uh, who is the person that's healed just now out there in the audience? You? Yeah. Are, we're strangers to one another. If that's right, wave your hand like this. See? i never seen the woman, but she was sitting there believing. Now, she touched something, didn't she? It wouldn't do no good to touch me. But now, can't you see that the Bible is exactly the Word of God? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We become tabernacles of that Holy Spirit, which is Christ. See? That's the real seat. Then if that real Holy Spirit gets into the real seat of the Word, not, it just won't take part of it because the devil uses that. You've got to take it all. See? Every word of it. Because he's not half God. He's all God. See? And that's what takes place. Now, here's a woman. I've never seen her. Jesus found a woman like this one time. Maybe not in the same condition. I don't know. And he's sitting at a well. He had need to go down to Samaria. And we find out Samaria was under the hill. And, and, um, or he's going to Jericho, rather. And he went around by Samaria. And come to a city of Sychar. And he sat down on the well and sent his disciples away for food. How many races of people are there in the world? Three. Ham, Sham, and Japheth's people. We all come from Noah. The rest of the world was destroyed at that time. Only three races of people. That Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan, which was half Jew and Gentile. That's all the races is in the world. See, just three. Everything in God is perfect in three. Like these three, I was talking of tonight, three stages of discrepancy, three stages of word made flesh, so forth. See? Now, and he, he had talked to the Jews, told Philip, uh, when he brought Nathaniel up, that where he was, said, I seen him when he was under the tree. He told Andrew, he brought Peter up, he said, your name is Simon, and you shall be called Peter from now on, said, you're the son of Jonas. See, now that was all Jews, but here he goes to a Gentile. Not a Gentile, but a Samaritan. Now's the Gentile's time. He never performed that one time to Gentiles. Search the Scriptures, never. But he promised in Luke 22 that he would do it just before the coming. But he sat down there, and here come a half Jew and Gentile out, a woman. And he said to her, woman, uh, bring me a drink. She said, well, you shouldn't ask that so much. We are, there's a segregation here. You're a Jew, and, and I'm a Samaritan. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. What was he doing? Contacting her spirit. And as soon as he found what her trouble was, well, he told her... To go get her husband. She said she didn't have any. He said, that's right, you've had five. Now look, when the Pharisees seen him do that right, that discrepancy right amongst the words, what did they say? They said, this man's Beelzebub, a fortune teller. See? And Jesus said, whoever spoke that on the Holy Ghost, when they come to do the same, would never be forgiven. There's your discrepancy. But he said he would forgive them then because the Holy Spirit hadn't come. The sacrifice of the Lamb hadn't died. But then the woman didn't think that. The woman said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. They hadn't had a prophet for hundreds of years. Said, I perceive you're a prophet. Now, we know that Messiah, which is called the Christ, when he comes, that's what he's going to do. Well, if that's what he did, then he's the same yesterday. That's how he made himself knowing then. Is it the same thing today? Amen. Amen. has to be. Now, here is a woman and a man meets again. She's not that woman. I'm not that man. But yet, the same Holy Spirit is here and made the promise that the works that He did, we'd do the same thing in the days that the Son of Man would be revealed. Now, not knowing you, and you know that's true, we're total strangers, and you're standing here. There's some, maybe something wrong with you. Maybe there's not. I don't know. But if the Lord Jesus will reveal to me by His Holy Spirit, what is your trouble? Will you believe then that it is the Son of God and not a human being. This is just a hull. This is a tabernacle that, that God uses any who He has chosen. He, he does that by sovereign grace and election. So, but you believe. You will. How many audience will believe it? Here we both stand, right here before the light. That we've never met in this life. 
I have no more idea who that woman is, what she is, where she come from, what she wants. I've never seen her in my life. No more than I've ever seen that woman down there in my life. But, see, here's what I'm trying to get you to do. Get that discrepancy away from you now and believe the Word when the Word is made flesh right here among us. The Word becomes alive in our own flesh. That shows the presence of God. I may He grant it to her. She's wanting a worthy cause. She's childless. She wants a baby. She's about 40 years old. That's certainly not impossible. They're sitting right out there now, women who are bearing all their life, and come to the platform like this, and the Lord give them children. Some of you raise your hand out there that know. See? I picked up a little darling girl the other day. Sunday after I left here, a Sunday afternoon, that her mother was barren, the Lord spoke, and the little girl, the sweetest little thing, is she here? Where is she at? Here she is, right? You're sitting right down here, the mother sitting there. Here's the little girl herself, see her? She was a spoken word from God. Now, will you believe Him with all your heart? Do you believe that that blessing that you have, that you feel in you now, has been God answering if God would tell me what your name is so he could name the baby, would you believe? And Miss Thompson, you can go home and have your baby if you believe it with all your heart. <laughs> you believe with all your heart? Just have faith. No doubt. Just believe God. God is God. How do you do, sir? I suppose we're strangers too. The only time I ever seen you in my life as I know of is when you was coming there and I thought you were a brother. Ship, Ship Karen, Uncle, Meshagan. Brother Meshagan, the singer, when you come by and then I seen you going to the prayer line. Now, being a stranger with you, and or to you, and I a stranger each way, now, if the Lord Jesus will tell me something that you, it's your, maybe what you're wanting, let's just say that. Tell you, what, tell me what you're wanting. Now, he's already given it to you, the only thing is just enough faith to believe it. Now, how many understands that? Just enough faith to believe that you get what you ask for. Now, now, if you're up here wanting something and he can tell me what your desire is, then you know I don't know your desire. Then it has to be something here that's doing it. Now, according to the word he promised to do that, he knows the thoughts within their hearts. Is that right? All right. You have a great desire to be healed. One thing, you're suffering with a nervous condition. Real nervous. That's right. Another thing, you've got a back trouble. And that back has been very bad for some time. You've even had an operation on it. That's thus saith the Lord. That's true. That's right. And here's another thing. Your deep desire is you want to receive the baptism of the Spirit. That's exactly right. Come here. Dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ, may this man be filled with the Holy Ghost before he leaves these grounds. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just have faith. Don't doubt. How do you do? I suppose, as far as I know, that we're strangers one to the other. If that's right. Well, so it, people who know, just raise up your hand so you see it. We're strangers. I never seen her in my life. Knowingly. Now, I guess she never seen me unless it was out in the audience because the Heavenly Father knows, and here's His Word laying here, that I have never seen the woman knowingly in my life. Therefore, I wouldn't know what you're here for. Have no idea who you are, what or nothing about you. I couldn't tell you one thing. Only thing is just a gift. If I can, as you heard me explain that a while ago, just move over here. What he says, what I see, I can say it. What he doesn't say, I cannot say. I'd say that in myself and it'd be wrong. It'd be wrong. But if he says it, it's absolutely right. It can never, it never has been wrong. It never will be wrong as long as it remains God. See? Because God cannot be wrong. But if God can tell me what you want, what your desire is, or, or what you're here for, or something you've done, or something, something like that, you, or who you are, where you come from, or whatever he wants to tell me. You'd believe? Thank you. One thing, you have trouble with your feet. Your feet bothers you. That's right, raise your hand. You have a lady's trouble, female disorder. And you've got a great desire in your heart because you've just lost somebody or something. It's a boy. And your boy has left home, run away. And you want me to pray that he'll return back. 
God in heaven sent her child to her Thank you, and Lord. let the Holy Spirit stop that young man on the road Save tonight him, and Amen. send him back to his mother in Jesus' Hallelujah. name. Amen. He who knows will send him back to you. Don't worry. Uh, believe now. Don't doubt. Just have faith. All your heart, you believe, and God will grant the rest of it. Now, just those three or four discernings, whatever it was, they, I, I just went to, gets blind to them. Now, I can't explain that. There's no way to explain it. You say, you mean just that would worse than you preach there for 45 minutes or more? You think, yes, sir. If it's three hours, it wouldn't be that much. A woman touched the garment of our Lord Jesus, and then people are not touching me. Well, this woman here, just look here. She could just touch her hands on. She just touched me all around. Wouldn't do a thing. I'm just a man. But she has to touch him. And I, by a gift, just, just, it just goes, all myself goes away, and I just say what I see. And that's all. See, touching me doesn't mean a thing. But she touches Jesus through me. That's how that woman touched God through Jesus. When he didn't know what was the matter with her, she just touched his garment and went and sat down. And he said, and he said, who touched me? And the apostle said, well, everyone's touching you. Why do you say that? He said, but I perceive that virtue has gone from me. Now, you know what virtue is? Strength. He got weak on one woman touching him. And he was the son of God. Amen. What about me? A sinner saved by his grace. You know what's more? Because he said, these things that I do shall you do also. More than this shall you do. For I go unto my father. Greater, it's said there, but they're right. Greek interpretation is more than this. What shall you do? Now, the lady, I know not. I have known nothing about her. She's just as total stranger to me as the other people were. We're strangers to one another. So if the people know it, you might raise your hand and say, we are strangers. Now, the Son of God, if he one time met a woman, a little panoramic like this by a well, and he talked to her just a moment, and he knew where her trouble was, and he told her what her trouble was. And so she knew by that 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 was the Messiah. Now that, that I've, you've touched me, I've touched you, nothing happened. But if my faith by gift and your faith by believing in it can touch him and he can speak through us, to, through me to you, then you know that he's here like he was at that, that well uh, at Sychar. He's the uh, same yesterday, today, and forever. You believe that. You have so many troubles, so many afflictions, Complications. One of the main things that you want to be prayed for is arthritis. That's right. That right. You're stiffening up by arthritis. When you see you raise your arm and you did walk out kind of slow, the best of my remember. Maybe just wait just a minute. Maybe something else can be said that'll take the. I, you know, you feel things. People, you know, like a breath coming against it. They say, "Why well, he guessed that?" Or you know, like that. But you seem to be a fine person. Just talk to me just a moment. Let's stand here just a minute. Because I do think there's something else that's in your heart that you're wanting from God. Now, I cannot answer your prayer, but he can read, because if you believe it, it's already answered. But if you just want to believe, to make you to believe. Now, I tell you, it's concerning a loved one that's not here. And that is a brother. And that brother is not even in this country. He's in a kind of a wet country, a lot of lakes. I'd say like, something like in the Michigan or some. That's Michigan's where it's at. And he is suffering with a deadly killer. And that is an uncurable kidney trouble that he's bothered with. It, that is right, isn't it? That's thus saith the Lord. Now, the handkerchief that you've got in your hand that you raised to God, send that to your brother and tell him not to doubt, but to believe, and that'll, you'll be healed. Now, you believe. You believe with all your heart? Then, if you believe, there's only one thing to do. That's absolutely accepted. Is that right? Now, you see, he's looking at that, uh, that people. That's what he's doing, looking at it. You see that so much. But that you might not know this, this lady here. Come up this way, lady. Here, the patient, wherever you are. I'm not looking at her. Do you believe that God can reveal to me what's your trouble? Raise your hands if you do. This lady here. This lady here. The patient. All right. And if you'll believe that with all your heart, that asthmatic trouble won't bother you anymore. All right. Go home and believe it. If you didn't look at her, did it? See, he, you look this way, the vision is there, no matter Amen. what takes place. Hey, man, can't you see it? Amen. Just perfectly as God can be perfect. You believe too? Asthma could leave you too, couldn't it? You believe it would? All right. Go tell the Lord Jesus that you, you believe it. 
Someday you have to pack a, a little teen around that arthritis crippled you. But he ain't going to do it. You ain't, you're going to believe it is, do you? You believe you're going to be all right? Go on your road. Hey, Jesus Christ makes you well. Heart trouble kills people. But it don't have to kill you. You believe that God will heal it for you and make you well? Go believing it with all your heart. Say, I truly believe it. You speak English. You understand English? Somebody, huh? All right? Will you speak to her while I tell her? Tell her she'll believe the stomach trouble will leave her. She, she will believe it. Your back trouble will leave you, too. So now you can go on your own and be healed. <laughs> How do you do? You believe? That man sitting there with back trouble looking at me and I said that he could be healed too. If you believe it, sir. All right, sir. <laughs> the lady sitting right next to you there. You got neck trouble, haven't you, lady? You believe that God will heal you? You don't lay hands on the little boy for his knees? And he'll get well too. You believe it? You had female trouble, ladies' trouble. You don't have it now. Your faith healed you and made you whole. You believe Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever? Then let's put our hands on one another and pray this prayer of faith, each one of us. Pray the prayer of faith. Dear God, while we're so covered in your divine presence, to see you moving out through the audience and healing the sick everywhere, thou art God. I pray that you'll heal this entire audience. Let the breath of God fall fresh into their hearts. And let them know that time is running out. We're just a little while longer to be here than we're going to be with him who we love. And may now his presence bring healing to everyone. We condemn Satan. We condemn all of his acts. In the name of Jesus Christ, Satan, come from the people. All that will believe him now and accept your healing, stand up on your feet. Say, I now stand up to accept my healing. I believe it. Regardless of your condition, if you really believe it, stand up to your feet. Now raise up your hands and say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for healing me. God be with you.